know we can do competition in a very healthy way. I may have to have a chat with my colleagues about my choir. How about your choir? <laughs> Our scripture comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 11, beginning with verse 32. Listen for a word from God. When Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she knelt at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. He said, Where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus began to weep. So the Jews said, See how he loved him? But some of them said, Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, again greatly disturbed, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone was lying against it. Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, already there is a stench, because he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So when they took away the stone, and Jesus looked upon, upward and said, Father, I thank you for having heard me. I knew that you always hear me. But I have said this for the sake of the crowd standing here, so that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, he cried out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet bound with strips of cloth, and his face wrapped in a cloth, Jesus said to them, Unbind him and let him go. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Unbind him and let him go. These words in our scripture passage today reminded me of the Unbinding the Gospel study that I led here this past Lent. I also gave a workshop introduction to the book during our Terry Horde Owens event here in September. It's written by a disciples minister, and in it she explored church evangelism, what she calls that dreaded E word that we're all afraid of because of how the word has been hijacked and misused and abused in, in its abusive ways. When I first learned about the book several years ago, I was intrigued by the title and topic, Unbinding the Gospel. In what way is the gospel bound up? And how do we unbind it? So I attended the author's workshop at the next General Assembly. And I quickly learned that the gospel is bound up because we don't talk about our faith with others. She talks in the book about how the faith, the evangelism at its core is basically faith sharing. It's sharing our faith. And we don't share our faith in ways that encourages others uh, to be in faith with, of God in Christ. We just don't know how to share our faith oftentimes in ways that are meaningful and compelling to others. In ways that profoundly speaks to why being Christian really matters to us and why that would matter to them. Why we follow Christ, why we go to church, why we are the church, and why we're a part of a faith community. Sharing our faith as others have shared their faith with us. These saints that we honor today. Unbinding the gospel involves communicating to others, not only verbally, but in our lives, the importance to our lives of a relationship with God through Jesus Christ in such a way that enables them to want that experience in their lives too. Sharing our faith, living our faith, teaching others about Christ in the way that it has transformed our lives, in a way that they will want that for themselves. 
Our faith in God through Christ transforms our lives. It makes a difference in who we are and how we react to things in the world, how we respond to events in the world. We live with hope, with hopeful assurance, so that we can face sin and life and death and brokenness in our relationships from an entirely new perspective. We live with that hopeful assurance that God in Christ will overcome all that keeps us from being whole. In our text today, we read about Mary and Martha and their brother, Lazarus. Mary and Martha believed that Jesus could heal their brother just as Jesus had healed so many others. They knew that Jesus was somehow the answer. They trusted that Jesus could stop Lazarus from dying, but their faith was limited. It was so bound up in the limitations of this world that they couldn't believe fully in the power of God to work in people's lives through Christ in all circumstances. We read in this story here that Mary and Martha thought Jesus was too late. They could only go so far in their faith. So I ask you, how do we unbind our faith so that we can experience fully the power of God to overcome even death? No, we can't expect our loved ones to be resuscitated when they physically die like we read about in this story of Lazarus. But we can have the kind of faith in God that doesn't allow death and sin and all the brokenness of, of this world to have such a grip on us that it strangles the life out of us. All Saints Day. On this day, we have the opportunity to remember those whose faith brought us to faith, or nurtured our faith, or helped shape our faith in one way or another. They have since died, and yet faith says they live because of what God has done in Christ. Memories are God's gifts to us that keep our loved ones alive for us. When their faith has helped shape our faith, they live on in our continued faith journey as we share our faith and bring others to faith in Christ. A dear friend and colleague was diagnosed with cancer a few years back, and I saw her at Regional Assembly this weekend and thought about these words that she wrote soon after being diagnosed. It's cancer. Well, crap. That's a theological term, you know. That's not what you want to hear when you're in between taking your son to piano and your daughter to horseback riding lessons. But after my annual mammogram, the suspicious-looking calcification had been biopsied, and wham, there you go. When I was pulling up to the doctor's office, I took a minute in the car before going in because I knew, really, that the doc hadn't said to come see her to get my test results because they were good. So I paused and prayed by saying out loud, whatever it is, Jesus, you and me, we got this. After the shock wore off and the swirling questions in my mind ceased for an ever-loving minute, I knew that it would be true, and it has been. There's a lot of theology that works for a lot of people that doesn't do squat for me. I don't begrudge people there. Everything happens for a reason, and if God brings you to it, he'll see you through it, sayings. I reach across decades for my comfort, she says. Decades of journeying beside people who are sick, abused, addicted, dying, laughing, living, growing, and soaring. Then desperately digging into scripture and Christian tradition to see, seek out some things that seem true and not just trite. So far, what I've discovered before I got here still holds. I believe I got cancer not because it happened for a reason, not that God brought me to it. I believe I got cancer because our world is broken. I'm made from our world's dust, and I live as a part of it. So I'll get broken sometimes too. That's okay. 
okay with me because God knows how much I love this messed up, gorgeous world. I have no desire to live in a bubble to protect me from sharp edges. I believe that God doesn't want the world to be broken like this. This wasn't in the original plan. God wants mothers to live to raise their children. I think that's a given we should all agree on. Cancer surely wasn't somehow in God's design for me or for anyone. I just can't get down with that. But I believe God can work the presence of cancer into something that will be good, purposeful, even beautiful in my life. I wouldn't choose to have cancer, of course, but I will choose to learn what it can teach me. Because I've seen God's grace shine brightest in the brokenness, like on the cross. I'm hanging in for that. You know, there's one saying I will buy. The worst word is never the last word. It's cancer, she said. Think again, I say. It's more. It's a moment for grace to shine. That's unbinding one's faith, my friends. Whatever the outcome of cancer, it's an opportunity for grace to shine. And whatever the outcome of the brokenness in our world, it's an opportunity for grace to shine. Not that God's grace and love will erase the cancer, but that God's grace and love will always have the last word. Even when cancer and other brokenness of this world might try and make us believe it has the last word. Frederick Buechner, an ordained Presbyterian minister, an American writer and theologian, said as much with these words. The worst isn't the last thing about the world, it's the next to the last thing. The last thing is the best. It's the power from on high that comes down into the world that wells up from the rock bottom worst of the world like a hidden spring. Can you imagine it? Can you believe it? The last best thing is the laughing deep in the heart of the saints. Sometimes our hearts even. Yes, you are terribly loved and forgiven. Yes, you are healed all as well. All Saints reminds us of the interconnectedness of the people of God and the incredible value each person possesses. The loss of any one of them from our earthly gatherings is an occasion for lament. The hope comes in knowing, as Psalm 34, 18 reminds us, the Lord is near to the brokenhearted. Therefore, in Christ, we are near to one another within each other's brokenness. Our story in John tells us that Jesus' tears communicate to Mary that her brother is worth grieving for and she is worth grieving with. They are together in the lament and they are together in the joy of resurrection hope. God refuses to allow death to have the last word. The saints before us call us out of the comfort of our pews, out of the safety of our lives, to share that faith, that hope, to teach others about a life in Christ, to invite people into a relationship with God, to expand the table, to unbind our own faith so that the good news of what God is doing in the world through Christ will be realized more broadly and more meaningfully. The story of the raising of Lazarus isn't about sickness and death. It's a reminder that when we follow Christ, we're being invited into life. Jesus said, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. As one of the workshop leaders at our regional assembly uh, this weekend said, when we decide that reaching people in the community is more important than being comfortable, then we'll do it. When we decide that the faith that we shared with us that we were, the faith that we were nurtured in is important enough to reach out into the community and share it with others so that others can have it. When we decide that's more 
important that our fear of being rejected, of our comfort of just coming in and sitting in worship on Sunday, the fear of being an introvert or I don't know how to share, I don't know what to say, when reaching other people is more important, then we'll do it. Is it important to you? Sharing your faith? Not to save the church, not to save the denomination, not looking into the future for a saving Monte Vista Christian Church, but to encourage others to have that life of faith and hope that we know here. Life abundantly. Unbinding faith. Thanks be to God for the saints, for the cloud of witnesses who came before us, because without them, there would be no us. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Gracious God, we thank you for your spirit that has helped to shape the faith of people for generations and thousands and thousands of years. We thank you, O oh God, for the gift of Christ and the life we share in Christ. We pray, O oh God, for a spirit of courage that we will go out, emboldened by your spirit, to share our faith with others in words and in deeds, to live the life of faith, of compassion, of love, and prayer.